okay, so our talk is titled, our talk is titled Pulp 3, and it's condescendingly subtitled, Stop Using R-Sync to Mirror Pebble. Uh, my name is Mike DiPaolo. As a brief summary, I've been a Metro assistant in internship at age 15. I recently uh, became a software engineer at Red Hat on Pulp. Um, and David? Um, yeah. My name is David. Um, I'm at Red Hat as well. I've been at Red Hat for five or six years now. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So the big first question is why would this system then want to mirror Apple and other package repos such as CentOS and maybe RPM views and then your uh, application specific repos? Uh, one reason is just you want to have faster access to the packages. You don't want to saturate your 100 megabit or 200 megabit internet connection when you have an 80 gigabit or 10 gigabit server. You also want to save bandwidth too because, especially for prisoning servers, that's going to be gigabytes for the packages per server. You also want to protect yourself from, from internet outages if there's <coughs> uh, so that you can continue to the servers no matter what the state of that connection is. And many customers have requirements like I have a zero gap network. I have to physically download them first and transfer them over, or you have some sort of semi-isolated uh, network that can't talk to the internet. And you think the easy solution to this is to just call rsync and call repo sync for each repo with a simple bash script. And once you have those outputted files on disk, like RPM files and metadata, the original uh, directory uh, structure and all, you would just push them on a web server. Say you have a web server that's HTTP colon slash slash uh, mirror slash repo slash apple slash seven. Seems pretty simple, right? This is a meme for the people <laughs> that expect every uh, adventure they go on to be quick and time, easily time constrained and uh, go smoothly. I'm not picking on Apple specifically, but it's a good example of this concept. Uh, some of the CentOS and RHEL, there's over 10,000 binary RPM packages. So it's very big, it's a, it does it's a gigabytes in size, I think. Um, and unlike us, but unlike CentOS and RHEL, it does not keep the old versions of packages. If, um, I think the temple package and uh, like Ansible, if 2.7.2 is the current version, that's the only version you will see. You won't see 2.7.0 or the previous update of 2.7.1. And it does not separate the updates from release content. It is one repo, Apple, not Apple <coughs> 7.6 versus Apple updates. So, first you just have that, that script doing its job of syncing that repo and all the repos. But then you start to realize, oh crap, I can't cruise in servers and access the content for updates or while the sync is in process. So you start to want to you want to continue to serve the old repo snaps until this thing is complete. So you're probably just going to like, you know, sync it to a new directory and move it over at the end once the seek sync is complete. And you have to have to make sure the sync completed successfully. And then you're going to realize, oh, I need to keep multiple snapshots. I've got a dev environment, a staging environment, a fresh environment. <coughs> so you have to have, you know, three copies on disk and your clients, like your young or DNF config file, will have to say, you know, access uh, slash repo slash Apple slash stable. And it's slash step slash repo slash Apple slash testing for the environment. And so now your script's getting a little more complex. And now you have, then you realize, oh, we need to keep access to the old snapshots because the old snapshots, like we, we ran into a bug that's only occurring on, on the recent versions, not on the version from six months ago that's already uh, went out of production five months ago. Uh, so you start having those there's folders on disk like uh, dev, staging, and production become sim links to versions, probably based on like the timestamps of when you synced. And then you realize, oh, if each Apple is say uh, 50 gigabytes, well, and you have 20 versions now using up a terabyte of space, so you're going to want to duplicate identical RPM files. You're probably going to do something like have a script in Cron that looks for identical files and put them converts them to hard links. And you also Another common thing too is you know, certain updates are going to break you. They're going to be where you not know, adapt your code so that you can for those changes. And you're going to need to start. Uh, this is where it gets even more complex because you have to start reviewing the metadata. That original signed uh, young metadata is now.
now be being regenerated by you and not included updates. And don't forget about patches removed too, because Apple does remove patches sometimes, especially when it's on response to maintainers, and they just don't provide security updates. So eventually, that simple script I told you about is now thousands of lines, as you add all that functionality. And every few months, you have to improve it or unbreak it. And I'm, and I say unbreak it because often the reason software is not going well is some external factor that you, or some additional use case that you never really have to deal with. And speaking from experience too, I've seen like at one, at one uh, uh, user of CentOS and RHEL, there's two teams. One implemented an rsync based solution, and one implemented a repo sync based solution. And every few months, they so they have to adapt it. <laughs> Eventually, you're burning yourself out because you wanted to solve all these other problems, but this, this your repo sync solution is becoming. Uh, I'll take a large portion of your time and break your schedule because it breaks when you try to do other work based on it. And Pulp is a piece of software that's designed to solve this exact problem. It is a repo syncing and general repo management content management solution for multiple types of content, RPM included. I'll hand it over to David now, who's written much more of the Pulp code than I have. <laughs> Right, so what is Pulp? It's a repository uh, slash content management solution. Um, it helps you avoid dependency problems. Um, Pulp uh, has a plugin architecture, so it supports multiple content types. You can see Docker, Python packages, uh, Chef, RubyGems, etc. Um, and for every content type, you basically have a plugin in Pulp. And so anybody can contribute a, plug a plugin. We have several. Um, Plugins that are maintained by um, community members. Um, Pulp is also open source, of course, and uh, we really focus on the community. And it's written in Python. Pulp 3 is in Py uh, Python 3. Okay, so Pulp 3. Um, so what are some of the features in Pulp 3? Um, first of all, uh, we have version repositories. Um, anytime you um, make a change to a repository, it creates a new version. Um, so you always have older versions of your repository as it existed um, in the past. Um, this also allows for easy promotion if you have lifecycle environments like dev, staging, production, um, and you have um, published repository versions. Um, you can switch out and distribute a different repository version in like a matter of seconds. Um, you can also roll back. So if the latest version of the repository isn't working, um, maybe um, some package update broke your uh, development environment, you can roll back to an earlier version of uh, the repository in a matter of seconds. Um, so another feature in Pulp 3 is um, we made um, plugin APIs, web APIs, um, very easy. Um, a plugin just has to define a view or view set um, an example would be like the Galaxy API for distributing Ansible content. Um, the uh, Ansible plugin uh, basically mimics that API, so I don't know if you've used uh, Mazer before, um, but Mazer works with Pulp by um, using a sort of uh, Galaxy-like API. Um, we also switched from concurrent features to async I.O. Um, to improve performance in syncing and parallel tasks. Um, we also expanded um, our support for deferred downloading. So this is like cases where um, you lazy sync EPEL down, um, but you actually don't download the packages until a client actually requests the package, and then Pulp will go out and uh, fetch the package and actually download it. Um, so we've expanded that, and it's now more plugins. And there's also more options like streaming. Um, so Pope will actually download the package in that case. It um, just streams it to the client. Um, and then also our REST API in Pulp 3 is um, it uses open APIs, so we generate docs for it. Um, there's also a bunch of tools you can use around that. Um, since it's an open API, um, uh, API. Um, some improvements under the hood. Um, 
So pulp 2 uses MongoDB, don't ask me why. Pulp 3 uses Postgres, yeah, I wasn't a fan of MongoDB, but. Um, also we replaced um, Celery with RQ. Um, RQ has a smaller footprint, we're basically using it as a task queue, um, so RQ better suited our needs and helped to reduce the code footprint in Pulp 3. Um, we also have a, a plugin API in Pulp 3 um, and it's semantically versioned, um, so um, plugin writers don't have to worry about their uh, new plugin API change breaking their stuff. Um, we also don't use symlinks anymore. Um, requests come in in the pulp app, um, looks at the database, and finds the actual file and serves it instead of relying on some links to um, serve content. Um, and lastly, pulp 3 overall has less code. Um, there were some features in pulp 2 that weren't very well implemented, and we dumped those. Um, stuff like um, scheduled tasks. Um, instead, we recommend users use cron, so we reduce the footprint of pulp 3. We have additional bonus slides on the installation method of Pulp 3 if you'd like. But this is supposed to be a lightning talk, and that's our lightning speed. Yeah. Any questions? Any interest in seeing the installer slides? Neil? Nope. So I'm somewhat familiar with Pulp 2 and all the different types of content that it supported. Um, is Pulp 3 only RPM stuff, or can it also support a wider range of content? Um, like in my case, we currently have a system that we've hacked together for Debian packages, but we want to be able to expand it to support both Debian and RPM, and also things like Puppet and Ansible stuff and things like that. Yeah. So uh, you know. Pulp, it's Pulp 4 is a framework for implementing plugins that actually understand the type of content you're serving. Um, we have eight content-specific plugins right now, including Debian packages. In Pulp 3. In Pulp 3, yes. Also, Pulp 3, Pulp 2 really didn't have a plugin API, really. I mean, you could um, write plugins uh, that work with Pulp. Uh, but Pulp 3 does, so it should be easier to implement plugins, so we're hoping to have more plugins. And already we have some like Maven and Ansible that didn't exist for Pulp 2, so. Um, so I know that in Pulp 2 there uh, there was um, specific like Puppet Forge mirroring and Puppet Forge uh, Puppet hosting support. Is that something that is going to come to Pulp 3 anytime soon? We don't have any plans for it, but um, if a community member were to implement it, um, that would be cool. We might do it eventually, but um, it hasn't been started yet. And I should point out that not all of these plugins are developed by us. We do have two, uh, the, probably two of these are community developed right now. Yeah, maybe the, three. The Debian and the Ruby Gem. Yeah, actually, the Chef, the Debian, and Ruby Gem plugins aren't developed by Red Hat or anyone. On you know, employed by Red Hat. Okay. Uh, so how are, is, is Pulp available in Fedora or in Apple or anything like that? So, um, yeah, I'll cover the uh, install installer slides. So, um, normally to install, uh, the, no, the normal way of installing Pulp 3, that's the most mature right now, is an, an it starts with an Ansible playbook and you pass variables Ansible playbook. For example, you say I want to install Pulp and I want the these plugins like Pulp Python, Pulp RPM, and Pulp File. File is a generic plugin that does understanding build metadata than like you know hash sums or whatever. Um, and you, uh, you can install from like you know your development versions on disk or from no, but normally it will grab them from PyPy. PyPI, yes, the, the the Python package repo which we can mirror. Um, there. Are, we are, I'm, I personally am working on two different ways of installing Pulp. Uh, one is RPM packaging in Fedora. The, you know, the, sh the short term goal is to have the Ansible installer install from uh, RPMs without any scriptlets instead of PyPy. And the long term, we'll consider you know, implementing the, the installer logic on, on with the scriptlets. Uh, 
this is on this is just on hold just because of the large amount of work involved. We have to pack it a total of about twenty five or so like of Python dependencies. Um, and we have a lot of requests for containers currently. Um, the uh, containers with the Kubernetes operator, but I'm also working on. Uh, I can go over them if you'd like, but then they, they don't. It doesn't answer your question. Yeah, it's still interesting. Go for it. Right. So, um, yeah. So lots of people want to deploy. Uh, lots of people like the ease of deploying uh, applications on top of Kubernetes. They have a, it's, it's, it's in containers. And they have a, an, what's called an operator demands the likes of the application. For example, if you want to upgrade from pub 3.0.0 to 3.0.1, well, the an operator can handle the upgrade logic, like you know, put the database in a good state, cleanly stop the services, upgrade one node at a time, stuff like that. It has other features that you can do too, like it can uh, an operator can uh, change the state of the cluster in response to external factors, like oh, there's increased load coming in on load balancer, therefore increase the number of pull content uh, processes, the web server process less containers from uh, two to four. Or there's lots of tasks going on, syncing tons of repos, therefore increase the number of pull worker uh, containers from two to four. Um, and lots of this functionality you expect too is, you know, the built-in Kubernetes are facilitated by the Kubernetes provides load balancers, provides monitoring of the services. Um, lots of, you know, the, one of the reasons why you need Kubernetes and operator anyways is because pulp is multiple services, it's uh, multiple processes, it's not only uh, like there's an API process that only like, you know, like sysadmins or developers that want to sort artifacts in pulp would, would, would call. There's the content process that uh, like every single uh, server that wants to access pulp or desktop that wants to pulp would access. And there's the workers and the resource manager as well doing work behind the scenes. So rather than adopt a bad container container uh, usage and have all those processes in one container, we do four different container types of containers, but based off the same image. Um, now, a lot of people don't want to run full Kubernetes. So to facilitate that, we're, we, we target the, the lightweight, very lightweight version of Kubernetes called K3S. It's like a 25 megabyte binary. It can basically I think just run from disk with sudo. Also, has an easy installer too, and it can use your existing Docker as, as already installed on your developer laptop or single test server, or it can bundle its own container runtime, uh, container D. And you know, the short term goal of all this work is you know a really a really sophisticated cluster. You know, like so it can handle, it can respond to increased load by scaling up the number of containers. It can handle upgrades, and you run across multiple physical hosts, not just multiple processes in one host. Um, and, but th this is still under development, though. But I'm work I'm working heavily on it. We, if somebody is interested in other types of uh, container patching, like a Helm's choice or a script to launch everything uh, on top of a uh, Podman or, or or Docker, we'd be interested in that too. Go ahead, Terry. How does it uh, do the snapshots and rollback? How does it do the snapshots and rollbacks? So uh, basically, uh, whenever you change a repository, it creates a repository version. Um, and to simplify it, um, these repository versions you distribute, like at a uh, URL. And the distribution points to the repository version. So um, if you need to, for example, rollback, you just point that distribution to whatever uh, repository version, you know, like if, 11 is bad, and you want to roll back to 10, you point it to 10, and then it would automatically serve um, 10 at that URL. So it's just copying the directory that contains that repository content on the back end, or is it using like LVM, then pool provisioning or something like that? So when a request comes in for some content, it goes through the content app, and the content app, all of the artifacts are stored according to their um, SHA checksums, SHA-256. So the content app looks up the SHA-256 uh, for the file. It has the mapping for the file to the checksum, and then it just serves that file. Right, and this is the Pulp 3 architecture. And you know, Pulp, whereas in Pulp 2, it's, you know, one of the reasons why we store files going to the SHA sums is you want to duplicate the content. If you have, you know, if it's Ansible 2.7.2 across 10 different repository versions, you want to have 10 different copies of Ansible 2.7.2. Uh, 
Um, and pulp two, it would, you know, it would it would deduplicate it, but you would have this, this all, all sim links on disk. If you want to create a new version, you would have to regenerate like all ten thousand or so sim links for Apple. Although we let the pulp two letter sped up the the promotion of like you know the dev versus staging sim links, for example. Because in pulp three, it's just a matter of making some database changes. It's uh, the files on on disk are abstract and they're, they're abstracted away from uh, what repository versions access those files. Cool. Thank you guys.